everyone to our seventh virtual atajo, I believe. Uh, and tonight features Adam Kay, who is a free scholar with BSIS and is a provost with the School of Historical Defense Arts, which is now Brisbane Swords. You have your hand up. Are you going to correct me? Get your name wrong? No, no, that's correct. <laughs> I was just waving hello. Hello. Uh, and he's uh, he's been working on a translation of Giovanni Antonio Lovino's Modo di Cacciare Mano al Spada, which is the method of putting hand to sword from around 1580. And tonight he's going to talk to us about Lovino and how it works and what it looks like. And if we can draw any connections to LVD, well, that's great. But if not, we're still going to have a lot of fun learning about Lovino. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's hand it over to Adam. Hello. Am I on? Yeah, you're on. Yeah. All right. So if you came here for LVD talk, you're probably in the wrong place. So go away. You don't need to pause to let them leave. <laughs> yeah, there are yeah, a few reasons on. to believe that Lavino wouldn't get along or really like anything to do with LVD. The first one is he really liked French. Second reason is that Lavina really loves his faints. I have a quote here from the translation. This is why I conclude that he who does not know how to faint well and defend himself from faints has little intelligence in our science. As he is, of course, referring to the science of swordplay. Um, so with LVD having little to no feints at all, I believe they have quite contradictory views. So we've got almost no correlation there between LVD and Lavino. However, there is a conspiracy about a common method between um, across the entire southern coast, going from Italy through France into Spain. This stems from the fact that there's at least four manuals which use the inside line, inside guard and outside guard um, used by Lavino. Those are Lavino, of course, Gudino, Heref, Lavino, Gudino, Heredia and St. Didier. Now I've only briefly looked at uh, Gordinho and a little bit of St. Didier, but we have Chris Slee here who might be able to draw some parallels with St. Didier, uh, having translated that manual. And possibly Lois who may be able to draw some parallels with uh, Gordinho. So that could be quite interesting. Yes. All right, so the main reason for this, um, for the common conspiracy about this common method is, of course, the inside and outside guards, um, which is essentially holding the sword relatively straight um, with the flat of the sword. Hang on, I got a sword here. We can go fingernails up, or divided, or defending the inside, or fingernails down, defending the outside. These positions are common across all four manuals, um, and uh, going across the entire section. So that is the biggest similarity between all four. Apart from other really common elements of swordplay, that's about where it ends. So the conspiracy is probably just a conspiracy. But what we're going to, I'm just going to take, I guess, through just some basic points of uh, Lavino's manuscript. And if someone else wants to chime in with um, some points comparing it to another manual, um, that's great. 
Right. Let me just scroll up here. Boom. All right. All right. So Livino is technically Italian, but he's uh, dedicated his entire manual to uh, French King Henry III, who is King of France and Poland, which is interesting. But he is from Milan, which was conquered back and forth um, through the ages. So, um, you know, and they're quite obsessed with France. So that makes sense. Um, the art in it is absolutely brilliant. And I'm not sure if I'll be able to show you some of the images as we go along. I might have to share my screen at some point. Um, but he has 66 plays, 32 of those are for the single sword um, that give us, that are like little stories. And it's absolutely brilliant because it gives the names of the two fighters and why they're going to fight. And then, um, you know, what guards they take and then just how they react to each other. And it's like reading a little story rather than a set of instructions, which makes it uh, quite unique because I've never seen a, another manual written quite that way. But that's one of the reasons that it, it drew my eye in the first place. All right. I'll just skip over that. All right. So I'm not going to bore you with a lot of the little technical parts. If you're interested in those, we can, um, I can go through those in detail. You can just read the translation. It's all outlined there. Um, but interestingly, he's one of the few manuals uh, that early who describes how to hold the sword. Most manuals don't, don't tell you how to hold the sword at all. And Lavina says, that's, that's very bad. No, no, no. You must teach a man to hold a sword. Because men, unlike animals, don't know how to walk when they're just born. We sit there in our infant beds for years going, wow, we can't do anything. So nature has really cursed mankind. So like we have to learn to walk from our parents, we have to learn how to hold a sword from our master. All right, so I'm gonna hold up my sword. All right, so pretty much what he says is take your hand. You wrap the two fingers around the hilt with the big finger around the blade with the thumb on the shoulder. He doesn't talk about the index finger, which is interesting, but leaves you with a nice hold on the sword, which is pretty similar to um, how most of us hold the sword already. Hmm. All right. The, uh, the footwork that Lavino describes is also, uh, it's, it's very simple. He doesn't really tell you how to move. He just says step. And he usually goes, step with the left foot and then put the right foot back in position. Or you step with the right foot and you put the left foot back in position. So whichever direction you're moving, you move that foot and then you bring the other foot back over. So you end up in exactly the same start position. It's uh, quite a simple, method and um, he does mention lunges and half steps but doesn't describe what they are at all which is frustrating but um, you just assume that they're, they're little steps which seems to fit in context with where he's used them so there's no no silly transverses where we cross our feet <laughs> No, yuck. All right. So Lavina goes over outside guard and inside guard. Outside guard is, of course, fingernails down. And inside guard is fingernails up. Now, fingernails up and fingernails down is 
quite common around in the French and Spanish area um, and used in the other three manuals, which is quite interesting. Although Livino doesn't necessarily call them fingernails, I prefer fingernails down. Um, that is the position. And can I share my screen? How do I share my screen? The command are at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So if you hover your if you hover your mouse at the bottom of the of share the screen. host yeah. is disabled participant screen share. That's fun. Mm, let me, let's tr try it again because I had you spotlit. So see if you can. Nope. All right, I might have to ask for Eddie's help because I don't know how to let you share your screen. Ah, nope, I don't know how to let you share your screen. Well, I'll just uh, describe to you where to find the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Um, his second and third pictures within his manual um, show the outside and inside guard. And the arm is quite extended, which, especially in the inside guard image, it shows an extended arm similar to what you might consider uh, a right angle guard. However, quite clearly in the description, he tells us that the flat of the blade is uh, parallel to the earth which means that, of course, the quillions aren't parallel, um, straight up and down, they're actually quite horizontal. So apart from the fact that your arm's quite extended, um, it's a completely different guard to right angle. Uh, he also goes through and shows us a number of different common Italian guards and how to fight them with his guards, but we won't go into that. Those. Nice. I was just thinking, Adam, if because um, I can share my screen, if you point me to where that file is and you tell me what page to go to, I can call it up and I can share my screen. Copy my translation handy. Uh, I know that you had it to me before. I can see if I can find it. Hmm. I'm not finding it on my on my computer, unfortunately. That's okay. I'm sure the uh, the interested will look it up. It'll be fine. Yeah. I have faith. All right. Defense. Um, Defense is where a lot of the styles differ. Um, with Levino, he maximizes his defense insanely. He prioritizes it above everything else. So what we've got is every single time he goes to defend, he moves his sword to intercept it, whether that be into an inside guard or an outside guard. And then he moves his body behind his sword out of the way, either with just the movement of the beta, like a void, or by stepping out of the way behind the sword. And he does that almost every single time. Um, in Gordinho, um, in Gordinho, Gordinho has three main rules for his, for his single sword system. If the attacks come into the inside, parry it, fingernails up. If the attacks come into the outside, Parry it, fingernails down, um, which is pretty similar. But the difference with Gordinho is he doesn't just parry. He's always a counter time thrust to the same target. So rather than doing a separate defensive action, my understanding of Gordinho is that um, he would do a defensive thrust into the attack of the opponent, where Levino would just parry and void to make sure he defends the attack before starting any sort of counterattack, which is an interesting separation. All right, Adam, I've, I've uh, managed to download a copy of your work. So if you 
want to point me at a page, I can show my screen. Uh, page 38. Page 38. Okay. I'll be right with you. There we go. Look familiar to anyone? It is, of course, the uh, inside guard. Flowis goes up two pages. We see the outside guard. Okay. A little bit more withdrawn. Yeah, so that's actually with the with the non sword leg forward. Hmm. Um, that is actually a um, a result of drawing the sword. Ah. Now, drawing the sword is another interesting point, Chris. Thank you for bringing it up, um, because Lavina is Lavina talks about drawing the sword. He has an entire section on it. If you go up another two pages, got a nice image there. There we go. And he says um, to have the left leg forward. Now, if you have the right foot forward, um, you're going to have a much harder time drawing the sword. So he says by putting the right foot back, you can more easily draw the sword out because of the position of the arm and the sheath. Of course, your left hand should be pulling back on the sheath at the same time. And the end result of pulling the sword from the sheath ends us in position number two, uh, which is the one we saw just before. Now, Lavino, like uh, Saint Didier, I believe, um, does some plays with the left foot forward and some place with the right foot forward. Don't quote me on that. I don't, I haven't read um, overly much of St. Didier, so I apologize if that's wrong. Um, but you know, Livino does have some place with the left foot forward and some place with the right foot forward, meaning that either foot can be forward depending on what you want to do. Yeah, Godinho, when he does talk about feet, does have plays that have either the left or the right foot forward. Mm. So that I believe is also a, a common thing because in the heat of combat you do step with the wrong foot <laughs> and end up with the other foot forward. So it's important to know um, how to step um, with reversed footing in my opinion. Right, so Lavina has um, well, two types of parries. Obviously, he has um, the parries for high attacks and parries for low attacks. Parries for high attacks, you just turn your sword so the true edge is against the sword. Voila, you're done, you move out of the way. Same for the inside, you turn the true edge, voila. You're out, you're out of the way, and then you move out of the way. If it's coming in below your sword, then you raise your hand and you drop your tip. This will make your tip um, point towards their thigh or their foot. But either way, the flat of the grenade is still towards the earth, and the edge is used. Are there is are there is there any illustration of those positions in the book? Um, Believe so. Give me a second. Mm -hmm. Play ten, I believe, has a nice one. Did you say plate ten or page ten? A10. Hang on. Yeah. I apologize. I don't have the page numbers. Yeah. Um, 
go to page 50. It's a nice parry of the inside from Octavio there. Uh, and if you go down to the 52, we see a nice parry of outside. Um, the low line parry you could probably see in plate 60. Oh, sorry, page 60. But there is times when Lavino says, well, you don't have to parry it. And it's pretty much just if you're confident they can't hit you without impaling themselves on your sword uh, because they're going for your foot, just move your foot out of the way and put your point in their face and you should be fine. Which is, you know, always a fun thing to do. Uh, and that brings us to feints. Now, Cordina, as I, um, Lavino loves his feints. His entire system is based on the fact that you can draw your opponent into making larger motions or panicking into making a larger motion than you have to. Um, and that gives you the time in order to attack them and hit them. And feints are some of his favorite ways to do that. Um, the most basic being um, the most basic ones that he gives you are the double beat, where you'd beat their sword out of the way twice in one direction and then cut them back in the other. So essentially you bash their sword one way until your sword's in the right position and then you reverse your cut and then slice their face, which is a bit nasty. So how, how does that work, that, that, that double beat? Is it sort of like a looping strike is, or is it a... Is it a, a back and forth, back and forth, and then back? Uh, it's literally, you beat the sword, it flies, it moves a little bit, you beat it again, so it moves a little bit, and then their face is here, so all you go is ha, huh, and you slice yeah. their face. Is there an illustration of that, maybe? Um, let's see, it's play five. So we're going to play 14 there. Let's see which page is that one. Uh, there is not. It's on uh, page 42, which is Curdio and Pompeo. But it just shows the, uh, the starting position. Unfortunately, a lot of the cooler techniques um, don't have uh, pictures right in the middle of the technique that would be quite interesting to see. But I'll attempt to uh, produce some videos of some of the plays so that we can see my interpretation in action. Yeah. Right, um, the second basic feint he gives us is the cut reversal which is a, well, what I call it the cut reversal. Um, you'd come in for a dritto or an inside line cut, and when they go to parry it, you would twist your wrist and come in with a reverso or an outside line cut instead. Um, the point being that they see a big powerful cut come in, they move their sword to intercept, then you switch your cut to the other side so they have a bigger motion to bring the sword back over. Um, the third basic uh, feint he gives us is feints with the point, which he doesn't explain overly much, but I assume it, um, it is a feinting a thrust, where you feint a thrust to provoke a parry and then, then move yourself to the other side and come in. Uh, this is yet another way you try and trick your opponent into moving their sword 
so you can stab him. <laughs> uh, he uses those in a variety of ways that um, I probably can't get into all of them at the moment because he uses them in lots of different ways from lots of different positions. Uh, it's pretty much if your point is pointing at him, which it should be all the time, you can threaten him with the point to try and make him move his sword. Um, ooh, here's a vulgar. Hand parries. Ooh, do you have pictures of those? We do. Play seven. Seven, which is page 46. Now what we see here is Hortensio in the blue as his um, as his offside foot forward with his hand forward, ready to push the opponent's sword out of the way. Now, Bovino says hand parries are bad and that you shouldn't do them all the time because you're gonna fuck up your hand. Sorry about the swearing. <laughs> have to bleep that out later. But he says uh, later on in his discussion that uh, he sees people who use hand parries too much have you know, massive disfigurements of the hand or use, lose function in the hand because they keep swatting swords out of the way and they get cut and become useless. So he says hand parries are brilliant and absolutely should be used but they should be used sparingly at a time where, um, where it's going to be safe and not leave you a cripple. That's interesting because Godinho, when he's talking about using the cape, he says, do not, and I repeat, do not use your arm to block cuts. He actually uses the word manco, maimed. He says, I've mm -hmm. seen arms maimed for yeah. cuts. Okay. Now, Levino says, you never block an attack with your hand. Um, the hand should mostly be used to, um, to beat. So you can use it as a parry defense, but mostly you use it to, when the sword's pointing at you, to whack it out of the way in a hand beat. So if your hand is out there, whack the sword out of the way so you can stab them. But um, interesting you mentioned cape because in Levino's cape, he holds the cape very much behind the sword. We'll um, find a picture for that. Second. Go to page 110. Now, the Casio on the right there is using Levino's method with the cape accompanying the sword. And what he will do is he will block every single attack with the sword. Okay. And the cape is there to reinforce the parry. And that's about it. So he uses the cape quite sparingly. And the only real difference um, with his parries while holding the cape is that he says you can parry with the, uh, the forte or the uh, tip end of the sword and the cape. So you have two points of contact. Whereas most of his other parries are all involved uh, using the forte or the hilt end of the sword to maximize the defense there. Hmm. All right, so against feints. There's uh, lots of things you can do against feints. Now, these could be applied to LVD. His advice um, is pretty universal. And he pretty much just says, don't make a movement larger than you need to. Don't move yourself out of time. If they're fainting an attack, parry, 
but only parry as far as you need to. Don't parry all the way to the sword. Just parry far enough so that their sword won't hit you. And if their sword closes in, it's going to hit your sword, not you. That way, if you parry with your sword, move your body out of the way, and they move to the other side, you can essentially defend yourself with the flick of the wrist, which is just as fast, if not faster, uh, than their disengage. So by keeping your motion small and condensed and not moving out to meet your opponent's sword, you, you defend against all paints. I'm not sure what any of the other masters um, say about paints, but Lavino is quite insistent that um, you should defend all faints. And if you're quite sure that it's a faint, uh, you might choose to parry with the forte tip end, as a double A tip end of your weapon rather than your forte, just to divert it out of the way. And then if they commit to that attack, you can commit to using a stronger part of the weapon. It's Justin here. Uh, what's interesting with this picture is that they've taken their capes off their bodies so that they're mm -hmm. now independent, which would seem to give them a lot more flexibility in either entrapping a sword or, or throwing it over somebody's face. But yes, um, very much so. If we go up a play to uh, 108, Lavino actually mentions the two ways to hold um, and take the cape off the body and put it over the arm. The first one is, of course, grabbing it by the collar ripping it off, and it's essentially just draped over the hand. Levina's preferred way is um, on the right there, where you essentially put your arm behind your back and shrug it off your shoulders, so that it's draped evenly over the arm, and this gives you the ability to throw it at, uh, you know, at the moment's notice, and gives you that extra flexibility in the way you can use it. That's also Godinho's method. Vespasiano mm. is um, the guy on the right, Godinho's method. Mm. That's quite interesting. And right. I, I need to look for it because I can't remember the play that it's in. But he describes that if you've got, you can see where Vespasiano's um, hand is. If you keep your dagger behind your back and not, you know, off on your belt being all ostentatious and showy off, then not only can you get your cape in, in, on your arm, but you can also have your dagger in hand. At least that's what Godinho talks about. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure Godinho is the most uh, reputable, honorable person to fight. You know, is he? <laughs> right, um, I'll move us back to single sword for the moment and we'll uh, touch on all of the Vesely offhands um, after I finish going through a few of those. If that's all right. Yeah. What page do you want me to go to? Um, just stay there for the moment. Um, okay. But uh, plays 14 through 19 give us the different finds, or trover, as um, Lavino calls them. And this is his version of stringere or atajo. And he calls it uh, you know, the nerve and fundamental principle of the science of arms. Um, just quoting from the discussion here, uh, just like money that is itself the nerve of war, thus a man cannot have perfect knowledge of this science, nor fight surely without knowing how to find the enemy's sword with justice and reason. By finding it, it prevents everything the, advers the ad adversary can do against him with the sword alone. Sorry, adversary. Can't speak. Sorry but he describes the technique as the point of the sword of the enemy is outside, outside the righteousness of his Vita, and the point of the finder is directed towards the enemy's Vita. Um, the Vita, for those that don't know, is essentially the torso of your opponent. So you want to direct that, move that point so it's not pointed at your torso or away from you, and you want your point pointed towards you. Oh, sorry, pointed towards them. 
Um, and this is because it is uh, you know, the most important thing. And it, he describes it as a, a new technique that he invented, which uh, a little skeptical, but, but I'll, I'll let him have that one. Um, essentially, it can be done from any position uh, above, the, above the hill, below the hill. We look at plays 14 through 19. There's some nice images there. Let me get some page numbers for you, Lois. Good. Yeah. Technique, what was the name of it? Uh, Trouver or finding. Okay. So, uh, give me one second. Uh, sorry, Travata, T R O V A T A. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, 14, page 60. That was 6 0? 6 0, yeah. Uh, this is the first find that he, um, that he demonstrates. <laughs> Essentially, you see um, Fulpio on the, in the blue there with his point um, pointed towards Venerio's leg, and Venerio's sword is pushed out so it's not pointing at anybody. You drop down a couple of pages. Down is in like 58 or 62? Oh, 62. Yeah, we have the similar thing up high. And we go down another two. Yep. There it is uh, on the opposite line. So it's the inside, um, but low. And the inside high is, yeah, 166. Now, essentially, by having your point pointed at your opponent, um, not necessarily directly at them, but um, within this, the vertical column of their Vita or body, um, they can't attack you because their point's pointing way off somewhere over there. And your point is pointing towards them, uh, which gives you a big advantage because then they have to provide do a whole larger motion of removing their sword online. And that brings us into um, what I've translated as the game of the half sword, which is essentially when two swords are mixed, um, are not meeting like that, somewhere near the mezzo, either one can uh, take the find. So if you've been found and your sword is off, you can push their sword out of line and put your other sword online. Uh, this is called a crush. So if you're actively using strength to push their sword out of the way to put your sword online, that's called crushing. And it's part of the game of force. What's, um, the, what's the term, that it, what's the Italian term he actually uses there for crushing? Uh, maca. I will get you a spelling for it in a second. M-A-C-C-A. Yep, I got it. Uh, uh, it. It just literally translates to crushing, so I've um, translated it as crushed there. Mostly so it makes sense to me. I apologize for people who uh, like the original Italian terms, but it's just the way my head works. Um, so the plays of force, um, well, the game of the half sword is separated into two main areas. You've got the plays of force and the plays of agility. And the plays of force are um, the crushing and the weakening. So by crushing, you of course move with strength. You can crush and step. 
Um, so you're using a smaller push while moving out of the way to gain the advantage, using a stepping to your advantage. And of course, you can counter crush against their crush, in which case you would push, your opponent would push, and you then are pushing against each other. And you're just fighting each other pointlessly with strength. Um, this is, of course, countered by the weakening, where if one person crushes, the other person would crush. Now, of course, if one person crushes and you weaken, all of that force that they're fighting you with will drive their sword further than it probably should. And that, theoretically, gives you the time to disengage around their sword and stab them. And that's the basis for the plays of agility. Uh, the plays of agility make use of voiding, so we can literally move our body out of the way with a step rather than fighting them. Um, we can shake our sword, or uh, the Italian term is scudere, S-C-O-D-E-R-E, -E, um, which from what I can tell is essentially um, an early version of the disengage, because it's you're shaking your sword underneath your opponents. So you can um, shake your sword underneath in order to move around the sword to retake the find. Or if you really want to be, if you really suck at the game of the half sword, you can of course deny it. Um, there are two ways to stop yourselves getting into the game of the half sword. Uh, hence denying it. One is, of course, when one person goes to find, cut them. Uh, if you beat and cut them or just do an attack, they're forced to um, defend themselves because you've moved their sword out of the way uh, with an offensive action. The other way is, of course, when they go to find your sword, you just keep disengaging around it so that they can never actually find your sword which would infuriate some people, but I find it funny. Uh, that's a summary of the game of the half sword. Um, then the final piece of the, of living a single sword is, of course, the close plays. Um, these are things that you do when, um, obviously, you've got too close. Hence, close play. Um, here's three main, three main things that he that um, makes use of in the close plays, which is, of course, no one is entering on the assault. So if you get a large bind, um, you can grab their sword and attack them. He describes this as, the main way of doing this is to bind the sword and the enemy's vita, entering with your point in the tempo when your enemy faints to hit you. So if your enemy faints and you just come in with an assault and grab their sword, that's his number one way. Um, let's play 20 and let's see if we can find an image for this. Um, 72, please, Lavos. Sure thing. Um, yeah, so there, uh, Natalia is fainted to the outside and Torquedo has come in with a thrust uh, in inside guard or now his fingernails up, grabbed the hilt and is pretty much stabbing him in the face. Now the second way he describes is in play 22 which I believe is Page 76. 
Ooh. Yeah, the second way is to always bind the sword hand of the enemy. Now in this one, he um, makes quite a solid bind with his sword. Uh, he puts his forte right up by the hilt on the sword and steps in, putting his other hand on the hilt of the opponent's sword and shoves his quillion right into the face. Which uh, is a bit vicious. Um, and then he states that the third and last way is to find and crush the sword, never letting your opponent have time to do anything as though he does not have a sword in his hand. Now, I don't know if we can make a comparison between this and an expulsion, um, but he crushes it and he'll use a lot of force to drive it downwards um, and out of time so that the opponent's sword flies out of the way. And then he'll step in and grab the sword while it's uh, pointing in a completely random direction. I can't tell you if it's anything like a uh, um, yeah, but it, it could be. All right. And then we get on to the the other fun things we can do um, at close range. Gonna play twenty nine. Uh, page ninety, please, Lois. Oh. Uh, this one, he starts off on the uh, pairing to the inside. Of, so the the inside. And then he flicks his sword around the opponent's sword while stepping forward, essentially moving his entire hilt around the blade to pommel him right in the face. So it's essentially um, it's moving around, moving your sword around the opponent's sword and stepping in behind your sword to pommel them in the face because you're too close to use the point. So. Why don't we use the pommel? Um, if we go to down another couple of pages to 92. Uh, and then he has a few grapples. As we can see here, he uh, does quite a large parry moving in. And then rather than trying to attack with the sword, he just steps in behind his opponent grabbing his off hand, and he'll push him off balance and send him to the ground. If we go down another couple of pages. This one's just fun. Essentially crushes the sword right down steps in and just gets a headlock over his face. Now, um, with the grapples, Lavino doesn't talk about any sort of exit plan. It's always, if you're close enough to, if you're close enough to grapple them, move in and attack them, there is no exit strategy. You end up subduing them, either putting them on the ground in a headlock, pummel to the face. There is no other way to get out. He just, he doesn't mention one. Um, so I assume if you're doing Lavino and you want to get in close, make sure pummel strikes and grappling is allowed and be prepared to, to fight. Because if you run away, you're probably going to get stabbed. Right. 
Right, um, are there any questions about the single sword before we move on to examining, just do a quick examination of some of the off hands? All right, I don't see anything in the chat, so unless I hear something from somebody or I see something in the chat, I think we're ready to move on. Right, we'll move on to um, some of the ways he uses the dagger. So if we just uh, go down a couple more pages last. All right, this is the first dagger play he gives us. And it's mostly describing the guards. Um, Poldorio on the side there in the blue is sitting in uh, a guard of expectation. He has his dagger forward and his sword back. Now what he wants to do is mostly just bind or beat the, um, the opponent's sword out of the way so he can come in with his sword. Uh, it's a pretty regular strategy there. Um, Trollio is using Lavino's guard uh, of inside guard and has, as Lavino says, his dagger accompanying his sword. Now this, um, it looks a bit like uh, Figueredo's guard as we assume it might be, but he doesn't move it down and he doesn't necessarily use it as an extension to Quillian or have it attached to the guard at all. He just says uh, nicely accompanying. If we go down to the next image, uh, 98. Yeah. Uh, we see a similar thing against a broadwood, or as Lavino described it, a, uh, an outside guard withdrawn. Um, the strategy he uses there is essentially just disengage around his dagger so that his dagger can't find your sword and force him to bring his sword forward. So just be patient and you'll be fine. We go down another couple. This is where he really starts to use his dagger. And uh, the strategy with these couple is essentially use the swords bind each other, they come down and they're binding each other. So they're, um, you know, they're out of the way. And as you're binding down low, doing a large bind with your sword, uh, your opponent's thinking about their swords. So you come in and thrust them with your dagger. Or well, Atone dies in this one because he's too slow to realize that he has to parry with his dagger and he parries with the flat, which you should always parry with the edge. Uh, if we go down another couple. Uh, this one's using a similar principle, but um, obviously we can do it up high as well. You do a large thrust to his face, he'll do a high parry in a panic, and then you come in with the thrust of your dagger. Now, there is a line of thought that maybe you shouldn't attack with your dagger because he can attack you with your dagger, but I think uh, it's assumed that you should prioritize your defense over any offense. So therefore, your opponent should parry it. Whether they will in HEMA tournaments, we don't know. So it could be a dangerous technique to use. Uh, this one is quite interesting. He faints the thrust to the outside of um, Celio's sword and then comes in with a thrust with the dagger while also disengaging his sword. Now, 
while he's disengaging the sword, the dagger's coming and engaging the sword, providing the defense, which essentially means he's thrusting with both his dagger and his sword at the same time after a feint. Uh, this, you know, so his sword should be engaged by the dagger and his sword should keep um, the other dagger, but Celio's dagger should be trying to defend Trevino's sword. Meaning one of them should hit. The defense, so, um, of course. Sorry? So, uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan has sent a comment and he says, I came in late, but the postures in general remind me of Agrippa, including that dagger one, which, yeah, looks like how I picture Figueredo. On the finding before, Fabris will say, trovar di spada, finding the sword. So he seems to have taken that concept and run with it. Both Italian, so going to use similar terms. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much so. I agree with that. Right, um, yeah, if we go down another couple pages, yeah, um, this plays using quite a similar principle where we're um, re engages the sword with both um, Regilio engages Polino Polinis. Sorry, I'm just going to butcher names, so I apologize. Um, Regolo just engages the sword with both the sword and the dagger and attacks with both because they're both engaging the sword. Right. And then um, uh, and that's all of dagger. So, so essentially Lavino's dagger is, you can defend with the dagger, you can defend with the sword. Uh, if you're using Lavina's inside, outside guard postures, keep the dagger uh, withdrawn, accompanying the hilt of the sword to defend yourself or if your sword fails. So, so the daggers that we see in these images, they don't look, you know, they, they're too early for sail daggers, certainly. Mm. Are, are these the uh, Cinque Dea? I, I am unsure. Yeah, it's the, I think the, the term translates literally into five fingers. So the, the dagger is very, very broad mm -hmm. and has small curly. Ends. I can't imagine that it, I can't imagine that it would be, but I don't know. Uh, the term in Italian is um, Pugnale. P U G N A L E. I don't know if that helps anyone. Yeah. P Puñale is like Spanish puñal, which is basically something that fits in your fist. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll, and then we come back to cloak. Yeah. Um, so if we skip straight to 110, where we left off, because um, we recapped how to hold the cloaks earlier. Um, this one, Lavina recommends Cassio's method, where he's holding the sword, the cloak behind the sword, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to he'll defend with the sword and reinforce the parry with the cloak. Uh, always taking the brunt of the blow with the sword and using the cloak to reinforce it. Um, Planko's method is uh, vulgar, even for Lavino, where he's holding the, um, the cloak out as a defense, so he can essentially um, divert any incoming thrusts with his arm while keeping his sword high and withdrawn to provide a constant threat because Gassio cannot attack while Planko's sword is providing a threat because otherwise they'll get a big double kill. So he literally has to um, find or encounter Planko's sword before he can come in for an assault. Uh, 
if we go down another two. Hundred and twelve. Yeah. This is the only play where he mentions um, throwing the cloak. But I use the term throwing loosely because this picture is supposedly at the end of the play after he's thrown the cloak <laughs> and he still appears to have his hand within the cloak. Um, which is baffling. Essentially providing a, a large uh, crushing and parry of the sword. He steps in with his crush parry and throws the sword over the head of his opponent. And he's beside slash behind them. That's it. Uh, any questions on cloak? Anything you'd like more detail on? Do we know how uh, long the cloaks were? How, how, like if you were wearing them, how far would they reach down? Well, I say cloak, but um, it's more likely cape. If you go back up to 108, Um, you can see the Clario holding the cloak, the cape, um, so the cloak, cape, um, up by his neck, and so it gives you a rough idea of just how long it was. So it looks like it comes down to about his hips. And the same with uh, Vespanio, you could see it there uh, draped on his back. So it really would come down to about the end of your poofy pants. So are you just trusting pictures again, or that is just based on the picture? He doesn't uh, give us. He doesn't give us any um, written advice. I'm going at Pugnale to Pugnacious Pugilism. Uh, we'll skip down to 114. All right. Ooh, bucklers. Yeah, bucklers. Excellent. All right. Um, so his use of buckler is uh, quite similar to uh, many of the others we see around the period in the style, um, where he gives us two main positions. One, of course, is uh, Mutanio, which is the buckler extended from the shoulder, and Terenio, who has the buckler accompanying the hilt of the sword. And um, and then his first play is mostly just don't try and cut someone with a buckler. Because you can just stick the buckler in the way and reinforce it with the sword and you're fine. Um, we skip down to the next one, 116. We have a uh, different perspective. Rutiliano on the right there is giving a guard of invitation um, on the inside, which means his point is low. So he's actually um, you know, creating an invitation, egging Minestio to, to attack. So the uh, angle of the buckler changes in the hand like that. It's not always just front on to your opponent. You can also open it up. Uh, 
Well, I'm not 100% sure because that mm. could just be the way that uh, the artist has rendered it. Mm. Um, it may just be slanted slightly. Um, what Lavino says is just the same, um, rattles off the same line about the buckler accompanying the sword. Mm. So I leave it to people to make their own determinations. But um, if we skip to 118, um, this plays uh, quite fun because he essentially punches the sword hand with the buckler in order to <laughs> in order to bind the weapon. Yeah, of course. Um, Many of us have probably seen a similar technique um, of using the cone of defense in other manuals. But um, it's, it's quite a nice technique and it works. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, there's meant to be another buckle play, but a page is missing from the original manuscript. So we don't have a play number 44. All we know is it's a buckler play. Um, someone's, some nefarious person has obviously thought the knowledge contained on this page was too valuable to be taught to the general public or that it was a crock of shit. We don't know. But um, you know, it's just, there's a note on, I think there's second page which just notes that it's missing and they found laceration marks within the book where it's supposed to be so, so it wasn't even torn somebody properly cut it out someone <clears throat> properly cut it off oh. i know that's that's a bit different a bit disappointing but we'll move on to rotella um, page 120. Right. Now, Cordino's Rotella is essentially hold the Rotella forward. Um, and while the engagement is low under the Rotella, and that uh, he doesn't recommend crushing overly much with the rotella or cutting because with the added strength of the rotella that it adds to the sword you can resist uh, a lot a lot more on the higher line so um, restricting it to the lower line um, you get a lot more opportunities unless of course you're um, you're trying to go for a play like the one pictured on 122. In this one, um, they're both engaged on their inside lines and he essentially pushes, he uh, steps forward, pushing his rotella onto the opponent's sword, pushing it out of the way and freeing his sword to come in for a low cut or thrust. Yeah, it is quite reminiscent of um, Bolognese <laughs> and I-33. Um, yeah, well, he is from Milan, which is kind of just down the road from Bologna. So he does have a lot of similarities to the Bolognese style. You can see quite clear influences in some sections, uh, like his method of cutting. Right, but that's all he really gives us for Rotella. Um, next up is his squaretage section. Can you do down a couple more? I personally found his squaretage section a little underwhelming. Uh, no one dies. 
essentially uh, the scratch is held, extend from the body, making the diamond shape. And he uses it to beat or move the opponent's sword out of the way, and that frees the way for you to perform a cut or a thrust. And that's um, a lot of, you know, most of what he does. Um, the square target itself will defend any cut by itself, given its shape and position, uh, unless it's you know right to the leg, in which case you stab them. Uh, if we skip down to 48, so 126. Um, the other square charge moves he gives us essentially is um, at a low game of a half sword where you're engaged with your opponent. You can step forward, bashing your, <laughs> bashing your square charge into their square charge, uh, rendering pretty much everything useless and making a giant stalemate. Uh, it's at that point that they end the conflict, which is a little underwhelming. Give me one second. There we go. All right. Um, then he proceeds to provide us two plays on how to fight the left-hander. Before Sorry, moving on, Ryan a, asks if uh, those square targets are to scale. We have no way of knowing. What page do you need me to go to? Um, just go down another couple of pages, 28, there we go. Um, so he's against the left-hander. Now I assume when this is published, there wasn't a lot um, published on how to fight lefties because he goes on about his rare and very rarely used method of fighting lefties, which is to suppress them on the outside of their sword. Um, the main theory being that you have a lot more maneuverability on the outside of their sword, where you can more easily point your sword towards them while defending yourself. Uh, so it's a very valid theory that has actually come up in fencing manuals for the next few hundred years. No, I can't tell whether he actually uh, you know, was the first to record it or not. I really have no idea. Um, but he calls it a, a new and rarely used method. Um, the old method being that you just move, you just um, carry them further out so that you have more room to move, which just seems like a bad idea because it's wasting time. Um, so you can skip down to 130, where he just mostly reiterates the advantage of uh, binding your opponent on the outside of this board, as Sel Canio is doing. So according to Levino, if you're fighting a lefty, you and the lefty will both fight for the outside, and it's probably just going to keep going until one of you dies. Right. Um, we move on to case. Page 132, please. Right. Here we have Choribo um, in a high ward and inside guard, and Akilo in inside guard and low ward. There's the ward. So Chibu is in your high ward and inside guard versus inside guard and low ward. Now what happens in this play is essentially um, Akilo takes the find, so he has the advantage on the engaged blades, uh, but he can't come in for an attack because Churubo's high ward blade 
will come in and stab him if he doesn't deal with that first. But because um, Churubo's sword is so far back, he can't engage it to um, get rid of the threat. So he essentially has to wait for Churubo to engage his sword. Uh, when Churubo doesn't come in with his sword because he doesn't want Urkelo to get what he wants, he essentially stays there and Urkelo eventually thrusts in with um, with his right-handed sword there, forcing Turbo to defend with his top sword. And then he stabs him with the other sword. I apologize if that's making little sense and I'm twisting up my words. Um, we skip to 134. Okay. Here we have the extreme of the game of half sword times two. Essentially, um, you've awesome. got one sword in outside and one sword in inside guard, and vice versa, so that all the true edges are meeting. And what happens in this play is they try and crush each other and use the games of force and agility, as I mentioned earlier, to try and trick the opponent out of time, but neither of them can do it because as soon as they get the advantage, it's parried. Um, and so sometimes they try with one sword and sometimes they try different things with both swords at the same time to lead each other out of time in order to try and hit the opponent. But they don't. So they're just trapped in this endless cycle of double X. That doesn't seem useful. No. The theory is sound, and if your opponent makes a mistake, you'd probably be able to kill him if he moves too far out of time and makes a motion that's too big, uh, which I believe is the theory he's trying to convey. All right. Then Levino has a section on hand and a half and two-handed swords. We skip to 136. Now, if you want to know what he does with his two handers and hand and a half, I suggest you read the first half of the single sword section because it's exactly the same. <laughs> he takes you through um, the basic cuts and um, his beat and cut method and his basic thrusts and his binding. Um, so I'm not going to uh, go through that Again, if you're interested in the long sword section, I suggest you have a read through the entire document because 90% of his um, single sword section can be applied to his and a half and two sword. If we go down to 138. Uh, he pretty much is discussing the game of the half sword with the hand and half. Um, so that's kind of, yeah. Um, and then he moves on to two handers. So 140, please ask. Um, this one, Sinkinio performs large, um, large cutting type motions that we see similar to a montante, uh, moving up and moving down, left and right. And he performs a movement called the sabrate, um, which translates as crosses, I believe. Um, it could be some sort of figure eight or a constant movement, I'm not familiar enough with uh, two-handed swords or the Bolognese systems to really comment. Um, but we'll skip to some of my favorite ones. Um, if we can get 144. Hmm. 
Now, this is Levino's ideas for if you are assailed by two opponents. Now, his number one recommendation for if you're dealing with two people is to have a cape because capes are amazing. Now, as you can see, uh, Ereclio on the left there is, um, he's got his sword high and he come down with, he comes down with lots of cuts only in his head. And Cassandro is pointing his sword towards Paul Leonardo's head of the chest. So he's threatening him with thrusts. So Paul Leonardo, he keeps the sword above his head to block the cuts from Arenkio and he dumps his cloak on the sword of Cassandro so that it's bound and he can easily quickly divert it. Uh, and pretty much what he does is once he's um, parried the cut from Arenkio, he performs a large cutting motion towards the head of Arenkio and then around to the head of Cassandro or, or thrust towards Cassandro afterwards, uh, threatening both of them. And in this way, he should be able to hold them off. Let's see swap sides. But if we skip down another two to 146. This one is probably my favorite. It's uh, how to interrupt a duel between two friends. And it pretty much follows the same pattern. Rufio and Eleanor go out to fight and they're busy trying to fight. And Otesti hears about it and goes, oh no. And he runs out there with his cape and he does a big bind on Rufio's sword to keep it away from Eleanor. And he dumps his cloak on top of Eleanor's sword so that Eleanor can't do anything. And then he just goes, what up guys, stop fighting. and settles the situation. So essentially he just jumps in the middle, which seems dangerous, um, and binds both swords defensively so that they can't attack each other. Right. Um, then he has a large section on um, spear or pole arm. Go down to 148. Now I'm not going to go into the pole arm at the moment, um, just because I haven't studied it quite as much as the others. Um, but it's also very similar to the single sword section, where you're just trying to um, make your opponent make a larger motion to move them out of time, and he uses the exact same principles, just in a slightly different way with a slightly different weapon that prioritizes the tip because of course you want to stab them. So if we just, um, sorry. If we skip to 158. Yeah. Uh, he does use both ends of the pole, uh, which is interesting. If they're oppressing the um, if they're pressing the pointy end of your pole, <laughs> you could just hit them with the body of your pole, uh, which I found quite funny and useful. Um, but yeah, essentially all the parries and similar things are you know, pretty much the same. So if we skip to the last play uh, to 162. There we go. This is uh, how he recommends fighting someone on a horse. Now, I'm guessing the horse is not to scale because otherwise <laughs> Farmone is uh, rather short in stature riding a pony. Um, but essentially, if he has his, if he's on a horse, uh, he will most likely cut down at you you want to intercept his cut with your dagger and you want to cut his horse. 
if you are the kind of person who is assailed by short men on ponies. So what he says is, cut the vita of the horse, because if the body of the horse, if you cut the legs, the horse is likely to fall down on top of you. But if you cut the horse's body, he's more likely to finish his gallop long enough that he'll fall over dead somewhere past you. So the horse won't fall on top of you. And then you should be ready to fight him with your sword and dagger against just his sword if he's not pinned under the dead horse. Everybody likes it when you kill that horse. True. It's cheating. <laughs> Nonsense. Uh, that is the last. You'll never make your fortune if you kill the horses. Pardon? You'll never make your fortune if you kill the horses instead of taking mm -hmm. them as booty. Ah. Well, I think this is more of a one on one duel, so. About a hundred years ago or so, there was one nation with small horses that uh, dominated most of the world. Well, you could argue that the horse is probably French and therefore not valuable enough. <laughs> <laughs> Expendable horse. So, is that pretty much the uh, is that pretty much the end of uh, plates that you want to show, Adam? Um, the only other piece is um, the discussion, which is the reasoning by Master Giovanni Antonio Lavino and Mr. Luigi Aluno on the science of arms. Um, which is um, just a transcription of a conversation between Lavino and Mr. Luigi, who is uh, a noble gentleman of Milan, apparently withstanding in the French, in the French court. Um, and they discuss different bits of uh, swordplay, many of which is uh, quite illuminating because without reading that discussion, um, it describes many of the techniques that he uses in the manuscript that aren't explained in the manuscript, if that makes sense. So I recommend almost reading the discussion before, uh, before reading the place, even though it's at the end. Oh. But it's, uh, it's full of great advice. But um, yeah, that's about it. So I apologize for my oversimplification of most of the plays, but I think we've gone on long enough already. Uh, if you're interested, um, it's, the translation is freely available. Um, get in contact with us if you cannot find a link. And yeah, uh, I, right. if anybody has any feedback on the manuscript, I encourage them to get in touch. I want to know if they've all got bare feet. They do not. They are wearing shoes. Same colour shoe? But they, why are they all wearing the same colour shoes when the artist has gone to so much trouble to give them all different beautiful outfits? Probably because the artist got sick and tired of colouring everything differently and went, that's it. All the shoes. Well, they also, might be feet and he just didn't want to draw toes. I guess ah. we'll also, if your shoe's going to get, if your shoe's probably going to get pretty dirty walking around right Renaissance Renaissance streets, you wouldn't want it to be really shiny because that'd make the mud stand out more. They, 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 they honestly look like slippers. Like there's a little line down the side, and I think they're just, you know, studio slippers or something. I don't know. But so you wouldn't wear that on horseback because no. without heels, you could just slip straight out of your stirrups. So to actually be attacking someone on horseback wearing slippers would be quite stupid. Or entertaining. Oh. All right, do, do we have any questions for Adam? He's been very thorough in uh, going through Lovino's text. Uh, anything? Yeah, just something to mention about the, um, the terminology for daggers. I did a search on Wiktonow just then, and 
Pagnale or however you pronounce it is the um it's the term basically every Italian manuscript I could find uses to refer to the offhand daggers. So it doesn't seem to be a weird thing particular to that manual. Yeah. No, I didn't think it was, but um, yeah. No, it's just the images look like uh, chinkadeas. Mm. Yeah, I don't rather, know how to pronounce the Italian. They're rather thicker than most fencing daggers we see today. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the swords also seem kind of on the um, short and thin side, but... Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is there any, like, measurements on the sword? You said it had that simple hilt, like like the one you showed us, but do they say how long they are? Mm, they don't give us... Well, Levino, in his discussion, but it doesn't give us any um, length of the sword. You can kind of make estimates from the pictures if you'd like, uh, but nothing nothing accurate yeah but yeah uh, thank you for listening to my interpretation of Lavino and please have a read of my translation yeah. well, thank you very much for spending your time with us Adam that was really thorough and yeah. and thank you for the work that you've done in translating that work translating that treatise. I apologize that it has uh, nothing to do with LVD. <laughs> <laughs> well, 